Well, the church is designed to war, and we are a holy priesthood of warriors. Anytime that you see the term in the Bible called the Lord of hosts, its term is used more than almost any other descriptive name in the Bible when it talks about God. God is the Lord of hosts, and the Lord of hosts is God is the Lord of the warriors, those that are assembling themselves for war. So warfare is a much larger picture in the body of Christ than we could imagine. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 18, it says, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. So God is the one that has chosen you and that has set you in the body of Christ, not how you pleased, but as he pleased. So each member is designed to war with a specific purpose. Your hand is not designed to kick. Your foot is designed to kick. Your elbow is not designed to speak. And so God sets people in the body, in the local church, where he says, this is where I need you to be. This is what I need you to do. Many people go through their life very frustrated because they might have found the right job, the right career. Everything can be going good, except they have not found where God has placed them in the local body. They may even go to church, but they haven't taken up the station and the post that God has said is theirs. So that's one of the reasons why we're having this ministry luncheon in a few weeks is because there's people that you have an anointing and a calling to do something in the kingdom, and everyone has something to do through the local church. Amen. Amen. And we realize, well, what does that look like? Well, it just means that we all get on board with what God is doing. So each member is designed. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Optimum warrior placement for optimum warfare victory. I'm going to say that again. Optimum warrior placement for optimum warfare victory. And what that means is God knows exactly what you need to be doing, how you needed to be doing it, so that we can have the optimum warfare victory that God has called this church to have. It's the soldiers that are working together, right? All off the same battle plan, and we're all beginning to move forward. So God is beginning to give us strategies. He's beginning to give us insight of how he wants us to begin to flow. There is an optimum environment for us that we've been designed to war. There's an optimum environment that we are supposed to be in in order for us to engage in the warfare God's called us to. And, you know, that's what we do. We come in this building. You know, the first thing we do, we make sure that the environment is right, don't we? We make sure that the AC units is on. And then you have the spiritual environment, right? The worship, the praise. We come in and we, we set the environment. We have a pre-service prayer together. And again, everyone is called to pray. I would encourage you to at least come once a week to pre-service prayer. It is part of your duty as a soldier in God's kingdom to pray with other soldiers. It's part of our calling in life is to pray with the other saints. We've been designed to war. That's how we've been designed. Our spirit man, once we were born again, part of the design that God gave us was to be warriors for God. So our, our spirit man is designed to engage in victorious warfare through proper training and discipline and environment. So part of us being in the house of God today is to get the proper training, the proper discipline, and the proper environment. Amen? And how many of you know that when you join the military, you don't just show up for two hours? For some of you that are in school right now, if you say, I want to become an attorney, and you say, but I only want to go to school once a week for two hours, right? How many of you know it'll take you a long time before you graduate? It would be simple for me as a pastor to just say, you know what? I just want to have one service a week. I got family. I got things to do. I, I would be doing the body of Christ a great disservice by doing that. He's called us to be a family that begins to move and work together. Amen. And hearing the Word of God, I mean, I don't know about you, but my life 
can get bombarded in battle really quickly. And so I need to be in the anointing of God to hear the word of the Lord being preached, the word of God being preached, to sense his presence, begin worshiping God, to reset myself, to get my head back in the game of what God has called us to do. How many of you know it's real easy to get your head out of the game? The enemy comes in, tries to push just the right buttons for you, but hallelujah, we get right back where we need to be. So... Uh, Think about this, uh, just our natural body. I can take anyone in here and and put you on an exercise regimen, right? The human body is amazing. Do you know what happens when you start exercising? You get stronger. Can you say stronger? See, God created the human body to get stronger. That's how he created. Your spirit, man, is created the exact same way to get stronger. The Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. But see, there are things that we do to strengthen ourselves in God. And so a lot of people just feel like, I don't have any strength. I don't have any strength. Well, it's the same way if you saw someone that sat on the couch 24-7 and they just said, I don't have any strength. Well, if you're never doing anything, you're never going to be able to do that. And, and that's why the Bible says, they who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. So understand, part of prayer, part of going to the house of God is a strengthening exercise. Yes. The more you go to church, the stronger you will become if your heart's in it. And so that's why. What, what do we want? We want people to be strong. The more you spend time in devotion to God, the more you spend exercising your gift, and everyone has a gift. Say, I have a gift. I'll tell you what, this next year coming up, I'm believing God that the giftings that God has placed on the inside of you, you're going to be discovering things that you never even knew before. Some of you are going to just begin ministering to homeless people. And just realizing that the power of God begins to come upon you. You say, I've never ministered to homeless people before, but I just felt this compelling to do it. And the power of God is all over me when I begin ministering to homeless people. When I begin cooking for some things and just just evangelize, just going out in the street and just finding people to witness to, God is raising up an army. And this is what I want you to understand this morning, is that when people get strong in the natural, sometimes weightlifters can reach a peak. You know that? If they're bench press or whatever, it's like, you know, they, they only get so strong. But I want you to know that there are no peaks in the kingdom of God. There are no limitations to the strength by which you can be strengthened from on high with God. When God begins to strengthen us, we go from glory to glory, from faith to faith, and he increases more and more strength. I think about mighty men and women of God who grew in the anointing of God in their 20s and in their 30s. They grew more in the anointing of God. They hit their 40s. They hit their 50s. They were still getting stronger and stronger where in the natural their body might have been weakening, but their spirit, man, they were becoming these powerhouses from God. And then some, they've gotten to their 70s, 80s, up into their 90s, and they're operating more in the power of God than ever before. See, God never created you to slow down in the spirit. He never created you to, you know, Moses was called to serve God all the way up until God took him home. Elijah was the same way. You don't just wane in your spirit. You grow stronger and stronger. So there are no peaks in God. You have been designed to war a greater and greater warfare and increasing more and more in the Lord's strength up until it's time for you to go home. So just get it out of your mind that you're getting weaker. Get that out of your mind. It doesn't matter what your body is trying to tell you. Say, hallelujah. My body might be feeling like it's getting weaker, but I'm getting stronger in the spirit every single day. And my prayers are effective. My prayers are efficient. And I'm going to war a good warfare. And I'm going to increase in the anointing of God every single day. Amen. And then you're, I mean, you'll just be a dynamo. You'll be 95 years old. Come here. Let me pray for you. Bam. Right? Hey. And I, we, believe, we believe that God uh, uses people all of age. I mean, I think somehow the older generation has gotten pushed aside. 
uh, in this new culture that we have, and it is wrong. It is wrong because God has not called us to just say, well, let's just raise up a new generation and just throw this other generation to the side. No, my friends, young and old, from generation to generation, we will praise you. We will extend the mercy and love of God to all ages and understand that there are some things that the older generation can teach and train the younger people. Amen. So there's no peaks in God. So the church itself is designed to work together to war. And one of the greatest uh, ways that we do that is in unity. I shared some scriptures, I believe it was Wednesday night, on the power of unity and how God has called us never to issue an unkind word about someone else ever again. It seems as though we were watching the movie Time Changer. There was a professor. It's a godly movie. There's a professor, and he had a pr problem with another professor, right? And instead of talking to the one he had the problem with, he started talking to his colleagues and started, well, what do you think about this? And they just said, look, you need to go to him. Don't let someone else pull you into their drama. If, if the moment, the mo I'll say it again, don't let someone else pull you into their drama. Yes, sir. The moment you start hearing them say something, you say, hold on, one, who are you talking about? So and says, let's get them on the phone so you can let them hear what you're telling me so we can all be in, in agreement. Yeah. We need to understand that the way that the enemy tries to work is divisiveness division, particularly against people in a church, and especially the enemy's specialty is to roast pastors. If he can get people speaking against a senior pastor, Satan delights when people can speak against a senior pastor. Why is it? Because that represents God's authority in your life. And if he can do that, boy, he can bring division. And if he can bring division, he can bring destruction. That's why the Bible calls strife and discord and gossip an abomination. you got to be real careful when people start doing this because the warriors have to come together in unity. Amen. Amen. So God is positioning all of us to find our battle stations and begin to fight. God uses his church as a vessel to implement his victory in the earth. Do not complain about where he places you. Allow God to place you where he wants you. Many people have never found their place. Some, some people may not realize that God may just want you to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Amen. And so, you know, you have to understand, no matter where you're at in today's echelon society, wherever you're at economically, whatever, God has a specific assignment in the local church, and that fluctuates over time. Things can change, but you just discover where some of your giftings are. Now, um, do not complain about where God places you. Now, how many of you have a fight instinct on the inside of you? Amen. Do you know who placed that there? God put that fight instinct on the inside of you. How many of you remember when Jesus, so what we're talking about is designed to war. It is a godly thing for righteous indignation to rise up on the inside of you. That's a godly thing. You have to learn how to temper what God has given you as a soldier. A soldier has to have a fight. You have to, that's what's wrong with the church nowadays, you know. They say, let's fight, and they go, rah, rah, rah. It's like, no, when it's time to fight, man. Put on your battle fatigues and let's go. Let's run to the battle. When Jesus came into the temple, he got on his warfare. Amen. What did he start? Man, he started flipping tables over. I mean, just, just throwing people's money was going everywhere, just throwing stuff all over the place. He says, he says you have made this a den of thieves. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. Of course, John the Baptist would tell him, you know, you're a brood of vipers. He would call them, you're a bunch of snakes. Who has warned you to flee the wrath to come? So what we have to understand is there's a good way to fight, but we don't fight with flesh and blood. So if you want to get angry, get angry at the devil. If you want to blow your stack, blow your stack at the kingdom of darkness and begin to see results. So there is a fight 
that God has designed you to war with, but it's learning how to temper that, okay? It's part of our design to see God's kingdom advance. Now watch this. Use your fight instinct against the enemy, not your brother. Uh, we don't need any friendly fire in the kingdom. You know what friendly fire is? It's when you're on the same side, right? And someone's just blowing their, 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 their gun, machine gun all over and kills some of his fellow soldiers because he wasn't being careful with what happened. But how many of you know that you can say the same thing two different ways and get two different results? You can have a situation that you're facing that is so challenging with a person or an individual and you can say the exact same words, but you can say it in a different way, and you can get two complete, total different results. Same words, same exact words, but you can come to someone attacking, accusing, very confrontational, right? You know, why did you say that about me? And right, you can go to them and say, why did you say that? about me. You hear me? Be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, right? Learn how to say things in God and let it be anointed. Amen. Understand that you can confront people, you can confront whacked out situations the right way and get completely, totally different results. Amen. Part of our design to war is to hate evil. Now, remember this. Some of you might have some physical limitations. When you've been designed to war, remember this. Physical limitations do not determine what you can or cannot do in the spirit. So no matter what, what limitations you feel that you have in the spirit, it does not affect you. No physical limit that you, limitation that you have can determine what you can or cannot do in the Spirit. What you have been designed to do in the Spirit is independent of any physical problem that you may temporarily have. Your spirit man is healthy. Amen. Your spirit man is ready to go. Your spirit man is rejuvenated. Sometimes you just have to get in the spirit. You've got to get the voices of darkness away from you and just flood your heart, flood your mind with the right things and understand that God is, is recreating his presence, his, uh, refreshing you with his presence rather. Now, God is also, let's talk about some of the physical things of our body that we've been given. First of all, he's given us spiritual ears. Now, what has God given you spiritual ears for? To hear the word of God and what else? To receive battle strategies against the enemy. And sometimes God may even let you eavesdrop on the enemy's camp. And there's a story in the Bible I want to talk to you about. Again, we've been designed to war. You have been given spiritual ears by God to hear certain things. Man, I never thought I would find out about all the mess that I find out about as a pastor without even asking. It's like God just wants the pastor to know things because the Bible says know the state of your flocks. To, to know what's going on in people's life. And I, you know, I'm not around following people with a, you know, whatever. It's just God just reveals things so that we can pray, not so that we can accuse and, you know, malign, but so we can cover and pray. So let's go to this amazing story in the book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. On Wednesdays, we've been looking into the life of Elijah and we've transitioned to Elisha. And this is one of those stories that we're going to be li listening to. This is amazing. And I believe this is a prophetic picture of the church and how God can anoint us to thwart the plans of the enemy. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 8 says this. Now the king of Syria was what? Making, there's that word, war against Israel. So again, we are in a warfare. We've been designed to war. And the enemy is waging war against the church. 
And he consulted, the king of Syria, that's the bad guy, he consulted with his servants saying, my camp will be in such and such place. Now watch this, verse 9. So basically the king of Syria is making these wicked plans to destroy God's people. Verse 9, the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, hey, beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down there. You see, here this king has made these wicked plans in his secret chamber, and all of a sudden the man of God is declaring it to the other king. Now watch this. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled. How did he find out what we were going to do? And he called his servants and said, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, what he saying, okay, which one of you guys spilled the beans? Which one of you told them where we were going to be? And watch this next verse, verse 12. And one of his servants said, none, my Lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So what is he saying? The devil cannot hide from God's surveillance system. Oh, hallelujah. So God can give you wisdom and insight before something ever happens about what the devil is trying to plan for you. And God can give you the wisdom and say, oh, oh, oh no, we're going we're gonna to stop this right now. And the devil goes, how in the world did they find out about what was going on? And someone said, well, it must have been a man of God. It must have been a woman of God that was listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The same thing happened to Jesus, right? Jesus walked up to Peter, and what did he tell him? Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. But I have what? Prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. So what is that happening here? Is Jesus was picking up on the plans of the devil. He was picking up on what Satan wanted to do to this brother, and he was saying, oh no, we're going to stop this right now. Amen. So understand, part of your spiritual ears that God gives you is not only to hear the word of the Lord coming to you, but it is to intercept the lies of the enemy. And so when the enemy comes and tries to speak lies over other people, you can go to people and say, hey, I just want you to know, this is what I believe God is saying. They say, how did you know that? How did you know that? <laughs> and it was a, a spiritu de santo, right? The Holy Spirit. Is that right? Spiritu santo, the Holy Spirit. So again, we are, we are designed to war with our ears. So that's why it's so important what you let in your ears. Let man be on guard with your ears. I'll tell you, most of us, most of us could use about 50% less time on the phone and God would be absolutely fine with that. Most of us would be, fit, would be fine with 50% less words. And God would be just fine with that. Hallelujah. The, the more words that you get out there, you know the Bible says in the multitude of words, there's no lack of sin. In other words, you start seeing, you start showing me someone is talking all the time, right? And sin can get in there real quickly. You've got to be careful. Now, God has designed us to war with our ears now also our what? Our eyes, our spiritual eyes. We've been designed to war. Okay? And that is discernment. That is when God needs to open up your eyes in a situation when you look. And I know sometimes you get broadsided. Some, some, sometimes the enemy loves to broadside people. And you just feel like, what in the world just happened? And you don't know, you, don't, you can't see the situation. You know what I found out it is helpful so many times is to, is, to, is to pray, but sometimes ask someone that you trust that's close to you to say, what do you see? You know why? Because they're not right there being broadsided with you. They can be a little objective and say, oh man, <laughs> this is nothing. 
so many things that we let ha- uh, disturb us have absolutely no true value in what's going on. It's just a big facade. It's a joke. It's a lie. And the enemy blows up this thing, doesn't he? Oh, look at this. Look at this, right? And we go, oh, yeah, this is terrible. And someone that's outside of the situation says, that's nothing. And when you put it in the line of eternity, my friends, when you put it in the eternal spectroscope, you go, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean, that has no eternal value whatsoever. What's important is my relationship with God and my relationship with his brother. Money means nothing in the kingdom of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. You, stu- you study all the men and women of God that were there, right? How many men of God say, oh, Lord, I need to pay my bills this week? You know, God provides for his people. God provides. So we have to have spiritual eyes with what God is doing. And this happened also with Elisha. Again, we happen to be in the same It's amazing. It's the same chapter, just a few verses later. I hadn't planned it this way. Uh, And it just happened to where now we're going to see how God can open your spiritual eyes. In verse 14, it says, Therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. This was the enemy. And they came by what? Night and surrounded the cities. This is how the enemy tries to operate in our lives. He sent horses, chariots, and a great army. He always comes by night. He always comes when you can't necessarily see what's going on, and he surrounded the city. So you might even feel like, look, man, in the natural, I am surrounded. There, You could be facing a situation right now, and you feel like there's not a way out. You feel like if you look at every situation that you're facing in front of you, back of you, all around in the natural, you're surrounded. There's no answer. Well, this is what he was faced with. And the servant of the man of God arose early and he went out. Verse 15, the servant of the man of God arose early and went out. There was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And the servant said to him, This is no problem. No, what did he say? Alas, my master, what shall we do? That's that's King James. He probably said, what are we going to do? Right? I know, I'm not going to ask you how many of you have ever asked that question to God before. (laughs) What am I going to do? Thank God Jesus never had to ask that question. You know, Jesus never said, what am I going to do? He would just say, Lord Jesus, Father God, show me what your plan is. Show me what your will is. You know? And so, because many times you're not going to do it anyway. God just wants to open your eyes so you'll see what he wants you to see. So it says here in verse 16, he answered, the man of God answered. What's the first thing he said? See, that's the main weapon that the enemy uses against God's people is he wants, number one, to get you to look at the situation. He wants you to admit that you're surrounded. And then he wants you to fear. Whenever Jesus was confronted with people that had illnesses or disease or sickness or really bad news or bad reports, the first thing he told them was what? Do not fear. So that's the first thing that's got to go, is when you feel you're surrounded, when you feel, remember, you've been designed to war. A warrior does not fear the enemy. A warrior does not fear. Oh, I felt that. The warriors of God do not fear the enemy. We intimidate the enemy. We are not the tormented ones. We are the ones that torment him. We're not the ones with the bullseye on us. He's the one that's got the bullseye on him. You understand that, that we're, we don't have anything to be afraid of. We've been bought with blood. We've been redeemed by the, the great God, Jehovah. And I just keep thinking about after Satan is gone, how wonderful this is going to be. And so what are we doing now? We're enforcing the victory that Jesus has called us to enforce. He said, do not fear for those who are what? With us are what? More than those who are with them. Now, there was two of them. (laughs) 
There was two guys and potentially thousands of people around them. So what are you saying? In every situation that you encounter, you have got to look beyond the natural. You've got to get out of the natural realm and realize that you are a spiritual warrior. So there's a battle. I mean, there's a battle right now in this room, right now. And boy, the angels are here. <laughs> they are all around this room with flaming swords, right? And the devil ain't touching any of them. You hear what I'm saying? There's plenty more angels of God with us than devils of hell. So he said this, do not fear those that are with us are more than those that are with them. Let's go to the next verse. And Elisha did what? Pray. Prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open what? His eyes that he can see. Now, I think, I don't know if Elisha already saw it or if he just knew it. You get to a point in God, you don't have to see it. Yeah. You, you, just, you just realize what's going on. You know, hey, this battle, man, God has really got this. And he said, Lord, pray that you open his eyes. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the, the what? The mountain was what? Full of what? Horses and what? Chariots of what? Fire all around Elisha. So think about this. They're sitting there in, in the middle of this mountain, and they see, this, they see these natural horses, right? And yet, all of a sudden, he says, okay, now, Lord, you show them. Show them what's really going on here. See, and I think sometimes you've got to realize what's really going on when God is saying, I am fighting for you. I am fighting for you. It's not just you taking out your sword. God will back you up as you use your sword. But you've got to realize as you, you wield your sword, you've got the host of heaven fighting with you on your behalf. You are not alone. Well, it's just me and you, Jesus. Yeah, he says, and my host of heaven is with you. He's the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of hosts. Look, if God is going to send Elisha an army of chariots of horses of fire under the old covenant, how much more now that we've got the blood of Jesus is God going to surround you with his protection? You've got to understand that the mountain is full. Turn to your neighbor and say, the mountain is full. Amen. Now, we have been designed, I'm closing, we've been designed to war by the Lord through learning how to flow and operate more and more in his power. Well, I have a breaker box at my house. Maybe some of you have one. And you know, they have little panels, right? And how many of you have ever overloaded those circuits? Right? And it's like a junk. So once... Uh, once you have a breaker panel in your house, it only, these wall outlets that are here are only designed to handle, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 or 30 amps. But did you know that they can be upgraded? And so our physical bodies, even in the natural, our physical bodies are able to handle a certain level of electricity. Anyone here ever been jolted with 110? Anyone here ever been jolted with 220? Okay, so, you know, that was a shocking experience, wasn't it? <laughs> And, and how many of you know that your physical body can only handle a certain amount of power, right? But I want you to understand that our spirit man, our spirit man is designed to war by learning how to yield to greater and greater amounts of the power of God. So just like that breaker box panel, it can handle a certain amount of voltage. Right now, you can handle a certain amount of the power of God in your life. But you can say to the Lord, Lord, Upgrade my panel. Yes. Hallelujah. Upgrade my power box. Yes. Right? And then you learn how to flow in greater levels of the power of God. You learn how to, how to operate it to where, to where you're not just believing that you pray for this one person. They're going to be healed. Amen. Their spouse is going to get healed too. Right? And then when you lay hands on them, their whole, you look, look, I know I'm just laying hands on you, but everything in your generations are about to change. Because I'm not, because the power that I'm operating in is not just for him now. Now it's generational. Boom. And it just goes right down the line. So you realize no matter what level that you're at in God, God can begin to increase your power level. 
And that's what we've got to do is just get a hold of the power of God and just begin to say, yes, Lord, because Jesus said, you know, these works I do, you will do, and greater. But see, the greater works is as you learn how to work with the Holy Spirit. See, you've got to learn that you've been designed to war, but you have to learn the things that God likes and the things that God hates. He hates gossip. He hates complaining, right? You know, you ever think about the pe- children of Israel, right? They wandered and wandered, but they complained, right? But who did they complain against? Their leader. Their leader. Yep. That's right. So many times people say, well, they complain against God, but they also complain against Moses. We have to be so careful in our relationships, in life, whether they're another believer, a pastor, a friend, or whatever, you know, is not to complain. Why? Because you can short-circuit the power of God in your life. I mean, I, I mean, I know the Bible says that we can quench the Spirit, right? We can grieve the Spirit. So we don't want to do that. We want to flow in the power. We want to flow in the power. So we have been designed how to learn how to ha- handle more and more power. So that this is <clears throat> one of the assignments for this week. <clears throat> is as you're laying in bed this week and as you're meditating, as you get up in the morning, you say, God, I want you to show me how to operate in more of your power. I want you to teach me, Lord. And you know what will produce that? Not necessarily more prayer, although that can affect it, but obedience. When God says, I want you to call this person, you do it. When God says, I want you to check your attitude, you do it. When he wants you to go do this, and throughout the day, your power level will go like this. You won't ever need coffee again. Do you know why most people have to drink coffee anyways? Because they don't get enough sleep. Now, finally, you've been designed to learn how to handle more and more of God's power. And also, your, your spirit man was designed to war by thriving on a healthy diet. How many of you know you can take someone that's got disease in their body, that's been eating junk food and and unhealthy food and processed food and and, uh, uh, food that's been genetically modified, and then you can take that person, you can start feeding them the right thing, and guess what happens? Their health. All of a sudden, they start getting better. So many people in the body of Christ are eating a compromised diet. They come to church, they eat organic food, they drink healthy stuff. I mean, they've got the green drinks and they're, I mean, they're having grain-fed beef and and all organic, right? And they go, and they're getting their spirit man fed and they go right out spiritually and they start eating McDonald's, right? And then, they, and then they eat all this stuff. I mean, they eat all the, the garbage of the world. They watch some programs and they take part of some gossip or slander. Or they hear this and they've got the bad attitude and they say this bad and they complain. But then they go back to the house of God and they get some nice organic food again, right? It doesn't do any good. So you're always trying to start over again, right? Because God wants to flush all that stuff out of your system so you can begin to get healthy. Amen. Amen. And so we've got to be consistent with our diet. And you feed your spirit the right thing, and you will supernaturally get stronger and stronger and stronger. You've been designed to war. The final two scriptures in 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verses 4, it says, For whatever is born of God does what? Okay, so part of your DNA now is that you are an overcomer. That's who you are. This is the victory that overcomes the world is what? Our faith. So realize this. So you can say it this way. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Let's say it together. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So as you have that faith moving in your life, you become an overcomer. And then finally, at verse 5, but he, who is he who overcomes the world? but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 2, this is the final verse. And we are going to verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always, can you say always, always. causes us to what? 
triumph. So that word triumph, I think I've told you the story before, is I was in India and I was all excited. I was preaching and they, and, uh, they understood English, and, uh, but they also spoke Hindi. And Hindi was their main language. And uh, I said, uh, I, I was preaching to them. I said, what, what is the, the, the Hindi word for triumph? God wants you to know that you're going to triumph. Right? And they said, J. And I said, J? No. I mean, what is it really? What does it mean to triumph? They said, J. Well, that's my middle name. So I realized that every time I tell them my name, I'm saying Todd Triumph Beal. Todd Triumph Beal. And if you would have been there, I mean, it wasn't like I was trying to figure it out. I was right in the middle of a message, and I just stopped. And the Lord wanted me to know, don't you know, that I've made you more than an overcomer? It's part of your name. And every single one of us, your middle name is Triumph. You need to understand that. Your middle name is Triumph. And so it says, thanks be to God, which leads us in Triumph. Now, that word Triumph uh, it literally means an acclamatory procession. It literally means to give victory or to conquer. Can you say conquer? So God leads you in conquering through Christ Jesus and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. I walked in the house the other day and uh, there's this little box, little dome in my, in my dining room and it's got this little blue light on it. And I'm like, what in the world is this? And Sonia says, it's a diffuser. And it diffuses this, uh, these essential oils throughout the house. Well, we had some guys over and they looked at it and they said, what is it? I said, it's our surveillance system. <laughs> no, I said, it's a, I said, it's a diffuser. And see, what that diffuser does is it takes those essential oils and it begins to fill the house with that fragrance. And the Bible says here that God causes us to triumph in Jesus. And through us, right, we are diffusers. We're diffusers of the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit, right? To his knowledge, everywhere we go, we're diffusing that aroma of Jesus. Everywhere we go, we're just, here you go. Amen. So many of you have already done that. Many of you are already doing it. So how many other people do you know that need the aroma of the Holy Spirit in their life? So what you do is, is we're all little diffusers, right? We all go out in this community and they go, that is a beautiful scent you are wearing. What is it called? It's called the Spirit of Christ. And then if you want to smell something amazing, you need to come to our service. And then as we all come together, right, this beautiful offering of incense comes before the Lord.